Let's open our Bibles, please, to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Now, we're going to see how Lucifer, Satan, would, would, (laughs) 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 ours is being videotaped. Of course it is. That's why we're not going to sing loud. Humor makes your attention 80 times better. No, I heard it was 72 times better. <laughs> All right. I thought that was the wind, though. I thought it sounded like somebody left the door open. Um, <laughs> now, um, what is it? Okay. Now, see, I lost my train of thought. Now, that's not humorous. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yes, that's where we are. Um, ah, okay. Lucifer, <laughs> he, he would be the God <clears throat> that would go up. But Yahweh is the God that came down. I think that's such an interesting contrast because in in this whole disposition, this thinking that Lucifer had embraced himself, see, he embraced himself and which perverted every viewpoint. And so we say that Lucifer, Satan, is the opposite of what God is, though he's trying to be like God. And this will help us to understand a little bit about how he works. He also, um, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And that... He is the light that shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. But Lucifer is darkness that tries to reveal himself as light. And in so doing, he, he does not want... There's, there's, a strange, there's a strange paradox here. And this is part of that jealousy factor, that fire that is within him, that's consuming him. He desperately desires to want to be known so that he can be worshipped. Where at the same time, his modus operandi is that he is concealed. He is is, uh, behind the scenes. He is hidden. And not to be known as he would be known. As he truly is. And I would say that 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 one point could really, really describe a tremendous amount of issues that human beings have. Being as much as that we have have fallen and so we have in our old sin nature taken on this disposition from Satan in our unregenerate state. That on one hand... We crave uh, notoriety, celebrity ship. See, the whole thing of celebrity ship is that you, you, know, you come out. Everybody, you know, so whether it's, uh, you know, you are on the news or, uh, you know, you get a little 15 minutes of fame and people crave that. On the other hand, 
or, and, and simultaneously, if you really knew what that person was like, or this is the thinking, if you really knew what I was like, you wouldn't love me. You wouldn't. And so I have to cover myself, see? I have to, um, in a way, project a counterfeit image. And if we were to think about like every kind of image that is extolled and exalted in the human realm, it's counterfeit. It's counterfeit. They were talking about uh, these guys who uh, they were they were bodybuilders, and uh, one of the, one of the pictures actually uh, was. They took this guy's head and they put it on Arnold Schwarzenegger's body. And they didn't tell anybody. They just didn't, you know. And uh, <clears throat> we, we could do that for some of you guys here too, you know, like just like, hey. But we would, we would know. But see, <laughs> uh, and so even the images, and this is, this is scary because there is, there is a very serious problem amongst um, young women and their psychological torture with their image. It is unbelievable. And in, in manners of being anorexic or bulimic, uh, just uh, starving themselves, purging themselves, going through this whole, all because they see a facsimile of an image in their minds, which is not even real. You know, you're at the grocery line and they got, you know, these, these women, and that, who's to say? They, they're photoshopped. It's not even them. Oh, they took, you know, thank you very much, and they went in the lab. So we can see how deceitful, and I think somebody said that in one of their opinions, Satan is deceitful. We'll come back to this word because it's loaded, but what we want to see here in Ezekiel 28, um, 14, is we're going to see a human person, we're going to see a human being, a, a governmental leader, King of Tyrus. And this apparently, as Ezekiel is saying this, would, we would think it would be directed towards or directed about this person, this human being. Well, it is, but then it isn't limited to that. It is also addressing now and indicating that which is behind this leader. And one of the things that can be important to realize is that in, 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 in the world system, in the cosmos diabolicus, Satan who wants to be worshipped has to now work through the human agency in order to get his things accomplished. So he's got to work through governments, He's got to work through philosophy. He's got to work through education. He's got to work through economics. And the weak link is the human being. And the real problem, the real problem, is that the human being has volition. Um, I saw recently a, a video of, um, of a guy's testimony. It's a very good web website. You might if you want to go visit it, but it's called I Am Second. Anybody ever heard that? Yeah. Okay. Well, it is, it is these people's testimony, and, uh, and you know, they ended, they got them sitting in a chair and they videotape and they just tell their testimony. Well, one of these guys was this guy in his, this rock group, Corn. And what's so funny about that? I thought it was corny when I first saw the title. I said, and, you know, the guy had, had drags, you know, he's tatted up and everything like that. And I'm saying, like, what's that all about, you know? Well, I played it, and it was amazing. Because he was talking about this, this, this 
conflict in his soul and how somebody had witnessed to him. He went to a church, and, and the guy gave an invitation. He never went forward, but something happened. And, and, and so all of this, you know, like his stardom or whatever he thought that was or whatever, the people who, you know, worshipped these guys and uh, got turned around because the guy's got volition. You know, uh, you know, thinking of the, someone, a premier uh, tool, you, you know, the devil's using this guy with great success, great impact. And one night, you know, he gets saved and it's finished forever. And then back around, you know, Saul of Tarsus, whoever, come on, like, don't stop Saul. He's doing exactly what I want him to do. And on the road of Damascus, it's, it's, it's finished. You know, he who once persecuted is now preaching. <laughs> oh, I love it. So Satan's running a dangerous business. <laughs> but notice here, so we have <clears throat> king of Tyrus in verse 12 of Ezekiel 28. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, this language could not be attributed to an earthly king. I mean, it could be, but as we read on, we'll see some other elements that are pointing back, okay, and unveiling the influence that this leader had. And this leader, as we're going to see in just a few minutes, had amazing influence on God's people, Israel. And so there's a reason why behind this prince, this king of Tyrus, is satanic activity. So, verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle all set in gold, and the workmanship of thy tibrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Now, and in verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Right there, we see something about the significance of, of Lucifer's prehistoric ministry in as much as that he was he had authority over the other angels. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set you so, God says. That's, that's the place. See, so not only was he created, but he had been delegated responsibility, been delegated authority. But the misuse of that authority was not to lead the angels as he would in terms of the fact that it was mentioned here that he had the pipes and many scholars believe that, that that involved music. And so that this musical worship, which would have been directed towards God, now has been redirected and perverted towards self. And it's like, uh, I remember someone saying, they had listed many of the uh, uh, Gladys Knight and um, Aretha Franklin and, uh, and many others who they started singing in church. That's where it all started. And what happened is that now then the system, the cosmic system, gets a hold of that. There was a, <clears throat> um, there was a, uh, a number of Christian artists back in the, in the 80s who decidedly they dropped off the scene. And the reason was is because they, back then you didn't have a label that you could produce yourself. You had to come in under a label that could distribute your music. And they would go in and they, of course, have the songs that they had written and produced. And, uh, and so the, the, the uh, producer would say, well, you know, these are, these are very good songs. But, you know, in order to really get yourself marketed, you, you need to do a couple, just a couple of these these other songs, 
uh, you know, contemporary, back then, I mean, whatever they call contemporary. But the point of it was, was that you had to make a decision to compromise, you know, your, your value as a, as a believer and as, as, a, as a godly musician in order to get your, your stuff out there. And that has happened, and they call them crossover artists. Okay, very often they are. And you say, oh, no, but you're reaching a much larger audience. Yeah, with what? I don't hear it. It's not there. Okay. Enough opinionations here. Look, look at this. Um, so let's take a look at this. We have um, every precious stone in verse 13. I, I want you to see this because this is important. There are nine stones mentioned here in a unique order that were made, making up the covering of Lucifer and the brilliance, the, the beauty of, of, of his appearance. Nine stones. The similar stones which are mentioned uh, as the breastplate uh, of the high priest, he had 12 stones, three row, four rows of three stones each, in a specific order. And the three stones that are missing on Satan's covering are the three stones that have to do with fellowship with God. And it's very interesting, because that's exactly what Lucifer did not have. <laughs> and though his beauty existed and carried literally an identification very close to the heart of God, it was that very thing that he did not possess a capability of having. And that's why when we think of rebellion or when we think of the fall, the fall was to separate from a relationship with God, not, not, not be religious. See, here's the thing. Religion espouses the existence of a God. Religion has the notion that I can gain the approval of God, tell me what I must do. See, it's all based on works. Ravi Zacharias just recently came out and uh, one of his broadcasts, Let My People Think, and he, made, he just made that statement. He said simply, you know, like every other religion is a system of work no matter how you, you know, classify it, look at it, and everything like that. And he said, he said, uh, he said, no, they don't. <laughs> Cast that thought down. He said, <laughs> he said that um, the, um, the Muslim who, in his mind, he would take, the longest journey possible to the, to the mosque. There could be a mosque right next door, but he's going to go to the mosque a mile away and count his steps to authenticate his sacrifice to his God that would hopefully on behalf of that would gain his God's approval. All works. So... Satan could not and did not have the capacity or the ability. Though he had the nine stones, he didn't have those three. Now, the other interesting thing that's here, and I want us to see, is so we see that behind the king of Tyrus, Satan is hiding. He's hiding. People say, boy, this guy is very powerful. He's very influential. And he was. But it wasn't him. It wasn't him. And this is why when the Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, we're not, we're not dealing just with human beings. In many instances, it's principalities and powers that are authenticating their existence within the human realm by being involved with a person, a human being. And let's take a look at this. Now, covered all of 
Israel and Jerusalem. This is, this is the sphere of influence. And Tyre was a, was a merchant city, very commercialized, very much um, influential. But you can see the general area there with Israel and the Gaza Strip right there. This is a more modern map than, than uh, biblical times. But just so that you see, that green area was the region of Tyre. And, um, and so this king influenced this whole area. And his real name was Ithobalus II. But the interesting thing is that his name in the Hebrew was Eth Baal. Eth Baal and Baal. Where do we get this? Where do we hear this? Well, we hear it associated with false deities, but not just false deities, but deities that negatively influenced Israel in such a way that they would worship God's people would end up worshiping these, these deities and enter into an apostate relationship to the true God. So, is it any reason to say that the king of Tyre, who would have geographical influence in, in God's people, would be satanically energized in his realm and in his influence? In fact, um, they would call this area, the French called it Levant, which means a rising. <laughs> a rising. That this, that the activity here, and, and, and so Satan, in, in his involvement through this king, this, this monarch that reigned from a, a literal earthly throne, had a spiritual throne behind him. And... Uh, so it means in the ancient Greek, the place of rising. Now, Baal reigned at the height of the Tyre inf Tyrenian influence in the affairs of Levant. During his reign, listen to this now, his sister was queen of Israel and his niece or his sister-in-law as queen for a period of time in Judah. So you've got niece in Israel a reigning queen for a period in Judah, and there is a descendancy straight down to, guess who? Jezebel. And so, I think of the important things, and the reason I wanted to bring this out is that this stuff has real historical context. And, and, and so, we say, well, Oh, that's just talking about a king. Well, yes, well, wait a minute. Strategically and tactically, why would it be that this particular monarch would be significant and important? Well, obviously, because of this kind of impact that they would have upon God's people and the influence that we can see and is recorded in the Word of God. So, I got that out. That took five hours to dig that stuff out. And I said it in two and a half minutes. See, that's, that's just, there we go. But I, I mean, it's relevant because I want you to see that, you know, when the Bible makes these connections, it's like, it, it's not something, you know, so far removed. And we can then see that there are certain, well, let me put it this way. Uh, behind every fact in history, there's a spiritual reality. Behind every fact in history, there's a spiritual reality. And that's why, I mean, uh, what is it, back in 1963 when, when uh, the, uh, they decided that they were going to take God out of the schools. You know what they did? They, con they contacted all of the major um, publishers of... of uh, grade school curriculum, you know, your, your Huffington and, you know, these publishers. And they said, you have exactly 12 months to expunge 
any reference of God in your curriculum or they will not be suitable for sale. So it didn't matter whether or not the, the publisher believed in evolution or believed in Madeleine O'Hare or any of that. What mattered was that we go out of business. We just go out of business. See? We can't sell our books unless we do that. And that's exactly why they did that. And so now you have facts with no connection to the reality of God. So we don't think that any of this stuff has anything significant to do with the kingdom issues. And we'll go into that next week. That historic, when I look at history, I can't just look at it as a series of human events and just call it as that. There's something much more significant involved, and that's why the Bible makes a point to reveal it, at least on this level, so that I could understand and properly interpret certain historical events. All right? So, uh, Satan hides himself, and in this case, behind an earthly king, but his objective is to do harm to the people of God. Now, let's move along here. I'm going to, I'm going to go out of here and we're going to look at some things here. Let's, let's, uh, Let's go back to Isaiah 14, please. We're going to look at the five I wills here. Isaiah chapter 14, please. We read verse 12 in the beginning. How thou art fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, <clears throat> which did weaken the nations. Verse 13, for thou hast said in thine heart. Now remember we said iniquity was what? Connected to what? Aspect of the soul. The volition. The volition. See, this wasn't something that happened externally. It was something that <laughs> occurred internally first. In the heart of Lucifer. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation <clears throat> in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So here we see the I, the I, 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 I. Well, what is that all about? Well, it is that volition plays an amazing, amazing place, part in the plan of God. This is why God will protect your volition. And you know how he does that? He does it through what's called the divine institutions. The institutions of divine establishment. And um, we, will, we will go over these. You won't have to remember them, but I'll mention them on the fly so that we know what we're talking about. But the, <clears throat> the principles of divine establishment have to do with matters in which God has established these things in order to keep the human race alive. All right? Divine establishment number one is volition. That <clears throat> this is a critical element within the makeup of a man because it also reflects that aspect of being created in the image of God. Volition. Number two, marriage. Marriage is a divine institution. Men did not invent it, so men can't mess with it. But they do. And 
the institution of marriage between one man, one woman, leads into divine institution number three, family. Family. And why they are connected is because, see, <clears throat> family is procreation, not adoption. And just because you can get Sam and John, who get mail at the same address, who uh, keep the grass cut, and pay their taxes, that doesn't make, a, you know, does that constitute to be a family? Well, now you're messing with the institution. See? And be as it may that they have a financial stability that that would be a good home for, of course, a male baby. We won't discriminate, but why would two guys want a female? So, that's interesting. Oh, okay. okay. So we have this premise, and <clears throat> I want us to see this. Come on. An indictment is mentioned in Proverbs 30, verse 32. And it says, if thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, or if thou hast thought evil, lay thy hand upon thy mouth. What is it this is saying here? Well, <clears throat> lifting up oneself is a satanic principle. Being raised up by the hand of God is a spiritual principle, a biblical one. And then it says, and if you have thought evil, lay thy hand upon your mouth. Well, the word here, evil, is not the word that we would think in terms of intrinsic badness. It really means a plan. The word in the Hebrew carries the idea of a premeditated plan, meaning that in this I'm seeking something. And so we go back to what the, four, the five I wills were. Lucifer was seeking something. He was seeking to be even as God. And the natural man, when he lifts himself up, he is saying in himself that I am the highest authority. I am the court of final appeal. If it fits me, does me good, I will do it. And imagine that. Because that is a, that is a you know, <laughs> that is where the natural man operates. He operates, I mean, in, in you know, 1 John 5, 19, it says that the whole world system is asleep in the lap of the way. They're asleep. They don't realize. They think that it's all them, but it's not all them. It's like the king of Tyre. There's something behind that. There's something behind that. And though man has volition, I don't think I've ever mentioned this here. We don't have will power. If you ever hear somebody say, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstrap, son. Like, you got to make your mind up. If you're going to be anything, you've got to do it by yourself. That's, that's, that's the idea that you have within your own volition power. But we don't. Our volition is the means by which we hook up with a power system. I know I gave this illustration somewhere. I'm going to give it here, too. All right, what's this thing over here? Yes, it is. Now, that's amazing. 
I can just do like that, and there, they, you know, boy. Now, hey, I got, I got the power. See? Um, in fact, you know what? I'm going to unscrew this thing, <laughs> and I'm going I'm to take it with me. It's just one problem. It's no longer hooked up to the source, is it? But I'm going to... See, it's my volition, but it has to be hooked up to a power system. And it's either Satan's power system as the god of this world and the prince of the power of the air, in Ephesians 2, 2, or it's God, the Holy Spirit, and the word of God. And you choose. You choose. If I'm going to walk today and I walk in the filling of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says I cannot, cannot fulfill the lust of the flesh. They are mutually exclusive. It's not 60% God, 40% of the flesh. No, it's 100% or no deal at all. But when it's the deal and it's God, the Holy Spirit, then there's, then there's rest, then there's peace, then there's faith, then all of the attributes of God giving me what he has done through me, redemptively, now works out in a practical experience called walk of faith. But when it's not God, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God, then it is what? My flesh, my old sin nature now coupling up with the atmosphere. And so I'm very impulsive, I'm very erratic, I'm very disorganized, I'm very, I mean, and whatsoever blows my way, I have no convictions. I have, no, I have a lot of opinions, but I have no convictions. And I live my life for the satisfaction of myself because I think that's the highest goal I could attain. Or if I can be happy, that's all that matters. Whatever happens to you, that's up to you. So you see here... This lifting up and how that works. But where is the source of it? It's sourced in the original I willer of Isaiah 14, 14. Now, this, this will is so important. I want to, I'm gonna, we're going to look at two examples in 11 minutes. Come on. Um, let's turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. Luke, chapter 15. <clears throat> Beginning at verse 11, here we have <clears throat> the prodigal son. And uh, <clears throat> if you recall the clip we closed off with last week, then you can see this. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And he divided unto them his living. Now, you know, somebody asked me the question. They said, you know, the, uh, the elder brother, you know, like, you know, why is he upset? Why did he complain? Well, it's very interesting. Well, because, of course, he didn't get the fatty calf and his brother, you know, and all of that. But, you know what? There's something very interesting right here in this verse. The younger brother provoked the father to divide the estate ahead of time. This would have automatically happened. The first born, the eldest son, would automatically, by reason of being firstborn, he gets what? Double portion. It's coming to him. He knows it. But the, the youngest son kind of pops up now and with his volition requests that he gets his now. Ahead of time. But he says, and he divided unto whom? Them. 
So the elder brother didn't lose a dime. But he wasn't leaving town. The younger brother was. And so not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted the substance with riotous living. Riotous living. Oh, yeah. Hey, Mr. Party. Well, see, that's, that's an interesting aspect of it. But <clears throat> fundamentally, the word riotous here in the Greek doesn't mean kind of like what you and I might think it might mean. It really means <laughs> that... He's living without thinking of the consequences of his own choices. And who does that? We have to go back to Lucifer. Because you could never tell him that by his aspiration to be like God, that his future occupation would be in hell. In fact, I I read something interesting. I thought it was very good that the five I wills up turned out to be the five uh, descents down. (laughs) And I can't remember them all, so I'm going to move on. But uh, I'm sure it'll come up at some point. Now, so he spent all. He He spent all. You know, what was he doing? Making decisions for himself. basically living for himself. And we know this because after it's all said and done, he had no friends. There was no one that would come around to help him. So, you know, it's like, enjoy my party because I'm partying. But after it's all in it, you know, people just leave. They go somewhere else. And so... After he spent all, in verse 14, there rose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Now, here's something I think is so amazing. No one, he could never have calculated the famine. See? That was outside of his realm of thinking. But the problem that happens is, see, when I, when I, be, when I decide I'm going to be my own God, when I decide that I'm going to make the choices, when I'm going to decide that I'm the highest authority and I begin to make choices, I will come to the confrontation that I don't know everything. Actually, you know what I come to the confrontation of is that is I don't know anything. And that's a great place to be. And that's where he got. When it says that he came to himself, he realized that all of his volitional choices didn't get him where he wanted to be. And so he was left with one more choice. I'll repent. You see, it's not so bad, and we need to be thoughtful and careful and wise about this. You know, some people that we know, that we love, they could be family members, and they are, they are heading... I mean, like, they are out, they are riotous living. I don't mean necessarily that embarrassing so. But you just know that they're just living for themselves. Maybe they want a career, and they're just going to, like, burn and get this career and, get, you know, like, make a place for themselves and, quote, live happily ever after. But what they don't calculate is the famine. And that they can't control. But it's in life. The unexpected disease that comes because, not because they're bad people, but it, it has, they're human beings. They got a body of death. And so, a person like that, they begin to get reduced down in their options. And this is, this is the, and, and, and take me wrong, but this is the blessing of sin. That what sin does is it reduces a person down until they really don't have any other option left but to repent. And I don't mean feel sorry for the fact that they made a million bad decisions, but there's only one direction that they can go back, and that's back. Back. 180. That's what repentance means. See, repentance is not just turning a little bit. It says, well, you know, all right, I repent. And I go over here now. 
And I, oh, okay, I'm going to repent, and I go over here now. You know, I'm just changing directions. But I'm still, I'm still going that direction. 180 is what repentance means. So he came to himself, and he says, I will go back to my father. That, I mean, that's the greatest decision he made. In the lowest point of his life, it was the greatest decision he made. And this is what I mean. So sometimes we need to, <laughs> we need to wait because somebody might say, I ain't ready to come back yet. I think I got, a more, I got, I got, some, I got it figured out. I got a couple more options I'll play. And we need to be mature enough to say, I'll be here. Because I'm going to see you. And when I do, I'm going to run and hug your neck. Because I know what that's all about now. And I didn't go out and rescue them. <laughs> oh, boy. I remember a guy, and he, he, he was great, you know. I don't have time to tell you the story. I'm sorry. <laughs> Next time, maybe. And he was into rescuing people, you know, bringing them in the house, you know, setting them up. Man, he got ripped off. They busted up his house and everything like that. And uh, it was all said and done. He didn't have anybody staying there, and he wasn't helping anybody. He lost everything. I said, you know what? You need to wait. Anyway. So, verse 17, and when he came to himself. You know what? That's such a great picture, and I'm seeing it fresh right now. What does that mean, he came to himself? Well, who is the highest authority in his life? Himself. So he came to himself. And you know what himself told him? Turn around and go back. <laughs> I'll obey that one. But you know what I mean. See, and so this change, and, and, and so he goes back, and, and it's amazing. Um, so Ryan just living is just living in self-determination, self-realization. That's all that is. He couldn't control the mighty famine. And great was his need. You know, his need became so bad that he would, he would literally do something he would never think of himself doing. And that was eating pig's food. You know, and, and you've got to think of this. See, somebody who thinks that they're in control of their volition, if they run it long enough, they'll come to the point where they'll actually have to think about deciding about doing something they would never dream of doing. It's like, it's like the, 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 the casual drug user, and he says, you know what, I mean, I, I got it under control. And then he finds himself, he sees his mother's pocketbook open, and his 20, 320s in there, and he goes and takes it. And you'd ask him, like, what, you know, like, did you really think you were going to? I would have never in a million years thought of taking money from my mother. But the need, see? So... I will next week. And I think this is good. We can start with this next week. We were going to look at Jesus in the garden. A real volitional decision. A real volitional decision. See, in the right direction. Prodigal son in the wrong direction. Jesus' decision in the right direction. We'll see it next week. God bless you. Have a great night. Make sure you 11, 59, 59 seconds tonight. Okay? Amen.